You're listening to the Co-Creator Network. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Good afternoon. Welcome to Why Shamanism Now, a practical path to authenticity with your host, Christina Pratt. Director of the Last Mask Center for Shamanic Healing. She's talking about how shamanic skills can bring us to physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being, especially when nothing else can. Now, here's your host, Christina Pratt. Welcome, everyone, to Why Shamanism Now. This is your host, Christina Pratt, and I'd like to begin to call, by calling out to the helping spirits to be with us here today. So I call out to your ancestors and to mine. I call out to all of those people around the world who lived well, who died well, and bring all that is good and true and beautiful in our ancestral legacy to us, the living, that we might learn from those who have gone before us, that we might learn from their mistakes and not propagate them, and that we might be inspired by their perspective on their lives um, to bring a more enlightened perspective to our own. I call out to these ancestral helping spirits in their many, many ages, many colors, many places, and um, time spirits around the world and all of history to be with us and help us to bring this collective wisdom of humanity to bear on the challenges of our time. And I ask us all now to reach beyond these human ancestral helping spirits to those who have been here even longer who carry even greater perspective and even deeper understanding of what it means to be here and be part of the great web of life, to understand how to show up and do what it is that we have been dreamt to do and to do so in a way that truly respects all living things in their many shapes and sizes, human and non-human, plant, animal, bird, insect, and to understand that it is together that we all are creating the possibility for life to exist here on earth and to all of these ancestors we give thanks and we ask you all to help us help us the living be a force for life and for love here on earth and as these ancestors gather around us and these spirits gather around us here today let us gather ourselves and draw ourselves from the many places our mind might be at this moment drawing it into our head from our head to our heart And with the next breath, let's take ourselves from our heart to our bellies and from our bellies extending down to touch the earth. And take a moment, regardless of what the day has in store for you, let us take a moment and give gratitude for it. To give thanks for life, for the generosity of this earth's dreaming, that anything that is present in our life can be changed as long as we are still breathing. And we give gratitude to the energy of the earth and ask for help for us ability to respond in our time to those things that need change. And as we reach down into the earth, let our gratitude for the wonder of life and its great diversity and its immense beauty, let our gratitude pour out to all the different layers of the earth, moving down and down and down deeply and touching into those powers that gain their strength, gain their capacity to rejuvenate and restore us through darkness through silence, through peace and stillness. Let us reach deeply into these energies and draw them up like a drink of fresh, crystal clear, cool water on a hot day. Let us draw these energies up into our body and we invite these energies of the earth to help us to understand the wisdom of manifestation, how to be here in form in a good way. We call out to these earth energies to help us to understand Uh, who we are, where we stand in life, what we stand for, and to do so in a way that opens the door for those who are other than we are. For it is by being willing to open our homes, open our lives, open our hearts to people who look and think and are different than we are, that we we will all be provoked into becoming the men and women that we were truly born to be. And I invite us all to understand that we come to know ourselves through these connections, all the different aspects of ourself, and we're able to become into right relationship with our environment and those non-human things around us that are essential for life. 
we come into right relationship with all the other living things and right relationship with the invisible world. And in this way, may we come into right relationship with ourself and understand ourself as part of the great oneness of everything. And with these energies resonant within us, let us draw the earth energy up from our belly to our heart and our heart to our mind and rise up and out into the sky above and whatever weather it holds for you in this moment, out through the atmosphere and out into the cosmos, reaching all the way up to the highest power of the universe. And as we reach that energy, connect with it by whatever name you call it, however you conceive of it, to reach up and up and up and to connect with these radiant energies from above, to see yourself in this energy and this energy in you, for you are one with this as well. And as you connect with this energy, begin to draw it down, drawing these radiant energies down, bringing into yourself and your day the essence energy of blessings, bringing into yourself, into your day, into these proceedings, the essence energy of protection. And may we draw on these energies to find within ourselves commitment and devotion. We draw in the benevolence of our universe and open to it, allow it to move and flow in our life. May we call out to these energies that bring inspiration and illumination on those dark days. These energies that are that lighthouse in the storm. These energies that show up unknown and unannounced that help us to find our way through the dark times in our life. We call out to these energies to infuse ourselves and infuse our day and to help us to open to the beneficence of this world in which we are part. And as we draw these sky energies down into our head and our heart and our belly and extend them down to the center of the earth, let us become that channel, that channel through which earth and sky connect. These two great legendary lovers come together in that big love that birthed this entire experience of form into existence. And may that love awaken the true spirit of our own hearts. And as our hearts awaken and open and come online, let the fire of that crucible of transformation that is the purpose of each life to be ignited. And draw up the fiery passions of the belly that roil and boil around why we are here and carry that passion for our soul's true purpose. Let us draw down the crystal clear, detached uh, clarity of the mind and have these two energies so different in their nature dancing together in our heart. And let that dynamic tension give birth that third and most sacred thing which is unique to you. That memory, that sense, that inkling, that some sort of feeling about why it is that you are here. And may you find courage in that very same heart to take action in this day, large or small, to bring that gift, that why you are here energy into the world. And for all of the invisible help that we have to do that, I give great thanks for that help abounds and it is all around all of us. May what needs to be said be said here today, what needs to be heard be heard, and may these proceedings go forward in a way that is good for all living things. I'd like to give a special gratitude to Joshua and Alexandra, to Julie, James, Tara, Daniel, Therese, Dinara, Wong, Ronil, and all of the listeners who have donated to the show. If you're listening for the first time, the show is listener supported and has been for the last five years of the show, and we're deeply grateful for that support, for it is only because of listeners like you who are willing to donate amounts, large or small, um, that help to pay the bills that keep the show on the air and also keep the archives available at whyshamanismnow.com and iTunes and at co-creatornetwork.com for people all over the world to access through the internet and download at their whim and whimsy. So if this show moves you in any way, even if it's to frustration and irritation, you have been moved. And let that movement in the heart uh, motivate your actions in the world. And please do something, large or small, to help the show to grow. And if you're able to donate financially, you can go to whyshamanismnow.com, click the support button, donate any amount, large or small, um, once. You can set it up monthly, however it is you choose to. But we are grateful for all of it, for it all goes directly to keeping the show on the air. 
And if you cannot donate financially, there are many, many things that are equally as important and necessary to keep the show growing and vital. So I invite you to do any of those things that you can imagine that keep the content of the show alive in your life, that spawn questions, questions that become new shows, and a way for us as people in the world to begin to make shamanic skills a practical Um, everyday applied skill to the challenges of our own time. So thank you everyone for that. I want to thank Langston Kong for being with us yet again as we continue this tumultuous exploration of racism and shamanism. Welcome Langston. Thank you, Christina. (laughs) So we're moving on to part four. We, we naively thought we could, um, talk about this in two parts, but now we're on part four here today. Um, and I want to thank you, Langston, for sharing so much time uh, with us here on Why Shamanism Now to help to explore this this topic of racism and double wounding, and in particular today, what the hell are we going to do about it? <laughs> so, and <laughs> why should we bother, which is an important piece to remember for all of us. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, Langston is a shamanic practitioner specializing in and radical transformation. He stands firmly at the crossroads, his practice informed by the Western modality of inner relationship focusing, initiations into traditions of the African diaspora, and the contemporary shamanic tradition of Last Mass Center, and the guidance of his helping spirits and ancestors who help him to weave it all together, which... I can tell you as a contemporary practitioner is not always an easy task. So thank you, Langston, for your good work. So for those of you who want to find Langston, he is at occupy-your-heart.com. And you can email him at langston at occupy your dash heart.com um, and you are welcome to email Langston directly if you have questions you can email me at Christina at lastmasscenter.com we're happy to respond to your questions um, today's show is not live um, but that doesn't mean that we're not open to questions that you might have so just to summarize the other three shows because this is part four that it, essentially what we've what we've gone over so far in a nutshell to, to really save the time for the piece we really haven't gotten to yet is that in the shows that I re-ran leading up to racism about the power of blessing, the power of gratitude, those four shows, we did a show about resilience and a show about the highly skilled wounded child. All of these shows were to talk about the fact that we as humans innately have power. And that it is our responsibility as human beings to understand that power, to understand how to access it and to use it, and to recognize that we always have the maximum amount of power on ourself in the moment, and to understand how to use that. And then relative to our topic, the next thing we all need to understand is that in this culture of America – and I think this is true in other countries, but I, we, will, we are only going to speak about America today, that there is um, a systemic racism, which is um, a system that is grossly unjust. There, it, there's also sexism and, and gender and a, a bunch of other dimensions within this system, but we're focusing right now on racism. But the point is, it is systemic and it is unjust in that it limits individuals' expression of power. And the most important thing about the double wounding is to be able to constantly maintain your understanding of the distinction between the fact of your power as a human and the injustice in the system that may limit your expression of that power to the point of death, but it still does not take or claim or define that power. It simply limits your expression of it. I don't mean that's simple, but the point is, as human beings – We are all innately um, imbued with sovereignty and dominion and the power to be here and to take up space. And it is the system that then limits that. And to understand that and not let yourself slip into saying the system has taken my power. The system can unjustly limit your ability to express your power, again, to the point of death, but it cannot take it. And this, I think, is the essence of 
many of the wisdoms that have come out of people that have been incarcerated and realizing where their where their power lies and understanding that's not enough and so as we continued in the show we talked about how necessary it is to gain skills to be able to respond to the injustice in the world not just react and that ultimately we started talking last week about this idea of pay to play on how everybody is affected by the injustice in this system because to to not act in the face of injustice damages your heart that it is about each individual person's humanity and the need as a human being in the face of injustice to respond in a healthy way and to choose not to respond is hurtful regardless of where you are in this dynamic. And so um, the important thing is how do we do this then? How do we become people who can respond and not just react and do so in a way that we could actually begin to create a new system. And um, I don't know, Langston, if you have access to the um, the quote, which is one of many of people who understand. I mean, I found one from, I don't know, Henry Rollins, Rollins something. Just this, this people that are understanding, people of color, people who perceive of themselves as white, whatever, who understand this system is inherently built on this injustice. So finding equality and, and adaptation within the system is not the point. The point Absolutely, is – yeah. The, the, the quote you were uh, speaking to is by uh, Brittany Cooper, who's a professor of women and gender studies and Africana studies at uh, Rutgers University. And she was talking about um, what might be termed white feminism versus an intersectional feminism. And her quote was, one kind of feminism focuses on the policies that will help women integrate fully into the existing American system. The other recognizes the fundamental flaws in the system and seeks its complete and total transformation. And so I think, you know, anyone who's a regular listener of shamanism now, of why shamanism now understands that I personally don't want to be integrated into the contemporary American system for a number of reasons. But the main reason being is because it breeds disease. It breeds mental illness. It breeds hatred. I mean, it breeds all of this inherent injustice and sickness. So I, I don't want to be incorporated in. <laughs> you know, I want to I want to write a new story with people who are capable of writing a truly new story for a new world. And that's that's my that's what motivates me to bother to get out of bed in the morning. That's that's my why bother. Because the system as it is, it was one, not sustainable, um, but two, it's inhumane on a lot of levels. And like you were saying before we got started, Langston, it's a madhouse. <laughs> it's making, it's creating a madhouse out of otherwise decent people. Um, well, yeah, okay. I mean, I think, you know, not to get too topical, but but uh, I was watching the um, debate last night, unfortunately, and one thing that um, you know, Secretary Clinton was saying was that. She was talking about just a little side note how much of what police have to respond to in our country are actually mental health crises. And so I, I just was very taken away uh, back of it by how casually that was stated, that it's become so normalized in our country, the rising rates of um, mental health challenges in us as, as American citizens, that, that the fact that police are responding so frequently to mental health crises and maybe it, it's considered a solution or maybe they just need to be trained now to also be mental health professionals and deal with mental health crises <laughs> rather than thinking oh maybe there's something much more deeply wrong in the fact that there's these rising uh rates of of mental health challenges yeah it's just um Anyway, we've already invested a lot of show hours to that and ways to rethink yeah. mental illness and and culturally, you know, just the deep, deep problems inherent in the culture and that solutions aren't about fitting into this system, but in understanding how, to, how we become people who can truly change the system, which I think is really kind of our, our point today. And, and, you know, I think in the last three shows, what I reflect on, the two things I see that, that really limit our capacity to envision something different is pain. You know, it's really mm. hard when you're in pain and chronic pain every day and not to, to imagine anything but the immediate 
ability to get out of that pain. And, and I, as a human being, I, I, you know, I'm totally understand that. And then the other side of blind that, that really sort of makes us functionally blind, not that we're not capable of imagining it, but, but we end up not imagining it is just denial is just the denial that it's a problem and the, the constant telling yourself the story that this is acceptable and that this is okay. And, um, and, and again, back to the piece that my helping spirits keep really standing firmly on relative to all of this conversation is that the, the, the solution comes out of drilling down into humanity. And what do you as a human being need to do that is right for your heart? And, and, not, and not in a lovey-dovey unicorns and bunny ways. <laughs> I'm really fierce. Um, the reason to stand up to injustice is because it's breaking everyone's hearts. And a human's heart is what makes us great, not our minds, but our hearts. And really allowing the power of the human heart to be the transformational force that it is in our world. And that's really hard to do when your heart is either broken from the pain that you're experiencing every day or it's shut down because you're in denial. I mean, I mean there's a, a little simple example is um, uh, I, I was um, – sharing a situation with Langston and Langston was commenting that my boundaries were inappropriate and I had to laugh because my husband had told me the same thing but I had dismissed his opinion because he's a white man (laughs) 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 and then you said the same thing Langston I went huh okay and then as soon as I accepted that that was a possibility all of this information in my heart slammed forward to say, you know, just like like demanding my time and attention, to, which is sort of like many of them were like, see, I told you so, sort of, you know, realities in that situation that I had been in denial of, had been unwilling to hear because I was holding this particular position. So it's very, it's just, our hearts are so much more than we allow them to be in this country. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, our hearts and our souls. I think I think mm-hmm. most of those concepts are so little understood in our um, in our country. Though perhaps listeners to why Shaunism now would have a better understanding by by now of the distinctions between those energies. But um, I was just reading this this uh, piece on uh, I think it was Reality Sandwich by Chris Dirks, um, who which is called Political Shamanism and the Subtle Energetics of Racism. And I think you know this. I don't think the mental illness conversation is so. Um, you know, distinct from the racism conversation either, as you know, as we know, they're all Mm -hmm. connected somewhat, but even more specifically in really looking at some aspects of racism as disease, as we've been discussing, uh, he, Mm -hmm. he has this great quote in that article where he says, there's a pervasive fear button in the white American soul. Black Americans will speak often of how carefully they realize they must tread around white Americans lest they offend them. Black Americans will tell you about how their very physical presence scares many white Americans. They're doing nothing other than walking down the street, ordering a coffee, eating at a restaurant, um, and he goes into other examples, and they get the stares. They receive energetic darts a multitude of times on a daily basis. They sense an enormous shame in white Americans. That place of deep shame is very unhealed and therefore a very unsafe place. Um, if any black American purposefully or simply by accident touches that shame place in white America, look out. At that point, he is a danger. He can be labeled the reverse racist, be ostracized, called the racial epithet, or if he is young and in the wrong place at the wrong time, murdered. Um, I just think that's a, that, that sort of fits in with what you're talking about. Um, and that, that is written by a white American male. Um, but uh, I think he really hits on something that this is a disease that we're all need to engage with as a culture because it affects and limits all of our lives, even while those repercussions may be much more life or death threats for people of color. Um, all of us have our, our ability, the capacity of our hearts limited by living within this disease system. Exactly. And that shame that is exactly um, a perfect example of this idea that because I'm the one of privilege, I should just be in denial about this and try to keep it going. And it's a perfect example of how it's hurting 
everyone because it is inherently unjust. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit because like you said, you know, shamanism offers us a bit of a different take on what the heart really is and a bit of a different take on the soul in that there are things that are actually players. You know, it's not all about the mind and the intellect and the politics and but it's about actually understanding the 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 rest of the human being that must be brought to the conversation or the answers will not end up being humane answers it'll just be a new version of the same problems oh so Mm -hmm. what i wanted to talk about was um kind of this sense of what is what we're talking about from shamanism when we talk about a shared dreaming um and how um and how that evolves into a shared vision because one of the things that I – part of the reason I'm so willing to dismiss the current system is because as I look at all the solutions offered from all these different perspectives of people who are, who are within the current system, every single good answer is a problem for somebody else. You know, It's like so no matter how right you are, you're wrong. And so mm-hmm. it, 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 it isn't ever going to work. You know, so for example, I become so sympathetic to what is going on in in the life of the other that someone else in the other is going to accuse me now of appropriation. (laughs) It's just, it just goes on and on and on and it isn't going to work. So let's talk about dreaming. So when we talk about shared dreaming and vision from a shamanic perspective, what, what comes to mind for you, Langston? Um. I guess the power in inherent to shamanism, first of all, of a sense that there is a dream to begin with, that we are all living in, that there is this great dreaming that is sort of what I think the, the Iroquois called the real world um, or the, the with populated by the real people, um, like this sense that there is this, this reality that we are all inhabiting that is working to move through us each and every day. And we can be moving in alignment with that and helping new um, things in physical reality that we inhabit to be given birth from that place of these essence energies. Or we can, and, and engaging in a, in a way that serves life with those essence energies, or we can be working in opposition to it or ignorant of those energies and ignorant of how our actions are affecting that greater fabric of being that's wanting to move through us. Um, you know, these, these concepts are always very hard to put into words. So I don't know that I'm doing a great job of describing that, but I think that's just a big difference in the shamanic perspective. And I think, for, for example, with um, the Last Mass community, uh, I think for many community members, when we did our first um, conjure dance, so there, I know there's another podcast that talks about it a little bit, um, we, for the, I think many of us in the community for the first time really felt tangibly the, the vision of the community or the, the sort of aspect of the community that already existed in the dreaming and was just waiting for us to become the people who could see it and engage with it fully and bring it into manifestation in a way that served life. Um, and I think this well, this also relates to racism in the sense that this is not just like some, I guess, I don't know if I want to say it's, it's not a bug, it's a feature. I don't think that's quite accurate. But in the sense of that there is something bigger here that's wanting to be expressed, that's wanting to come through all of us if we can really engage deeply with the discomfort that racism is bringing up. And and I use discomfort to mean everything from the range of people, you know, dying every day, the people of color dying every day, and also just the discomfort of white presenting people engaging in conversations about their own internalized racism and privilege. And I think that there's in that discomfort, there's this greater dream that's wanting to come through that we have not yet completely become the people who can engage with fully and bring that new reality through that's wanting to be synthesized out of this discomfort and these struggles. And I think for, to me, that's one of the most unique um, perspectives that shamanism brings, that there, there is that something 
that we can work to become the people who can engage with skillfully. It's not just about the power of our own minds and thinking up something new. It's about engaging with what is and through the lessons that those experiences give us, becoming the people who can sense and bring through the true energies. And I think um, a piece that that is, um, for me, always present in shamanism as a solution is the recognition of how when we bring in these tools that are largely tools of the heart and soul, that the solution to things that are extremely hard physically and mentally are so simple. That mm-hmm. we'd been working literally for, you know, six years and all we did was dance for two hours. Now, it was a focus and intentional dance in a ritual setting. But nonetheless, in two hours, we accomplished what we had accomplished through enormous hard work for six years. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so for me, it's just, it's just that understanding, I mean, literally the understanding that what feels impossible – is made possible by skillful engagement with the heart and soul and the invisible world. And that that is an absolutely real and practicable part of my everyday life. And it could be of others as well if, if we are willing to go there together. And, you know, and, and, and that's, to me, um, hugely life-affirming. And um, anyway, so... Back to what you're saying, Langston, I think it's really important to understand this, this deep awareness in, in, in true shamanic cultures versus contemporary people who are just bringing shamanic skills in as a modality. I mean, that's a whole other story. But what we're talking about is that willingness to understand that there is no separation, that that's a lie, that we are all one, and more than that, this oneness was already dreamt. And that happened prior, and we are living it now, and we are dreaming the new future. And that new future will be precisely like this one if we do not choose to shift our dreaming. And, and in, in, in this language that I've been using consistently in my shamanism now, that is that being willing to work with spirit to become a better human to become a better version of myself that is able to be less filled with my personal drama and more willing to be a vessel through which that dreaming, as you talked about, Langston, and that dreaming comes through and gets manifest in the world. And to put a sharper point on this, when people are unwilling to do that, they dream up solutions like slavery, like child labor, like fracking. I mean, they, they dream up shortcut, self-serving, inhumane solutions to life's problems when they are unwilling to get out of their personal story and open themselves up in service of this larger dreaming because the larger dreaming supports all life. It is innately humane. It is innately a, a big oneness. You know, it, it, it has inherently the, the same logic in it is that I would not, you know, cut off my own arm, right? Because everything is one. And so it's wonderful to know this. But at this point in time, we need to be able to move beyond knowing into action because black children are being shot for no reason. And that's reason enough for me. Because – how can anyone be call themselves a human being and be okay with that? It's a child. So, <laughs> so moving on. I think we – I keep eddying out in every show around that because it's just so uh, unbelievable to me. Um, okay. So – so how do we do it differently? Um, so what do we each need to become different people? And I think we've talked – about different parts of this in each of the three parts of the show that we've already talked about. So what we're focusing on is how do we um, begin to do this dreaming part differently? Um, So (laughs) – 
I think, I don't know, would this be a good point to talk about the visionary energy and, and working with, um, I don't know, how do we work with vision? Um, yeah, I think that would be, that this would be a good place for that. I think that even even though you've done a you know you've talked a fair amount about the visionary and other podcasts i think i'm not sure that the visioning piece has really um been addressed enough and i think this is a good um topic as any to address that piece with um because i think that is another unique piece of shamanism is its visionary nature i think we talk so much in our culture about being a visionary you know creating something new usually it's in, around technology um, but we don't talk a lot about what does it take to actually dream something new and bring it into manifestation, especially when we're, you're already living within such a dysfunctional story and that story has become internalized in your perception of reality. Um, so I guess I'd love to, yeah, hear you talk a little bit about how you think we might start in a process of visioning to approach something that is bringing us discomfort like racism like you said like we know something in us knows okay a, a, a child has been shot that's wrong there's something not right here i need this to change in some way but i know that i might have internalized racism i know that i'm in a, a racist system and so where do i start like what what might i do in terms of engaging with a visionary energy to work to create some change Okay, and so in, in responding, I'm just, for everybody, I'm going to say, what we've already talked about in other shows, we've already talked about personal uh, process, working with your own um, shadow energies, working with your own, you know, this this sort of the personal work. How do I begin to be a person who's not reacting and is able to respond? And that for most of us, that means you need to learn a new skill some sort of emotional clearing skill. And these, these are things that we've talked about in, in prior shows. So assuming we've already recognized the fact that we each need to start with ourself and our own internalized racism and our own personal piece of work. The next piece that I would say, and I, and I feel um, supported by this in what I consider more mystical teachings – which is that recognition that human beings access the true power of their visionary capacity in relationship with spirit, in a working relationship with spirit. And since having a working relationship with helping spirits is so fundamental to shamanism, then to simply be approaching it shamanically already creates the conditions for that situation. So in other words, child is shot, I know that's wrong. I want to find out what can I do relative to this. I go to spirit and I ask, you know, what is the true source of this problem? You know, it's not about asking for immediate retribution. It's about understanding what is the true source of this problem. And some part of that answer will be me. You know, some part of that answer will be the system, but, but the, the willingness to, to open my awareness through the engagement with spirit to get a bigger picture and a, and a clear vision of what is going on. And so then just to stay with kind of the focus here of the show, if we focus then on the visionary piece, which is there will think there are things that need to be done immediately, but there are also things that are longer term because the true source of the problem of the child being killed yesterday is rooted in the past and the solution is in the future. And so with shamanic, shamanic skills, it allows me to go into the past, be it into ancestral issues um, or or um, other ways to look at, um, sorry, unresolved ancestral issues or the, the engagement with time spirits in the culture, which have to do time spirits, meaning a big bunch of people making the same kind of decision and creating a momentum of energy that begins to sway and move other people. Um, and so there's going back in time and disengaging the root of the problem in the past, which we are able to do through shamanic skills if we are willing to become the people that can do this part of work in shamanism. 
which probably I, I feel I could safely say at least half of the people that consider themselves engaged in shamanism right now don't have the big kid panties to put on to do that work. It's not easy. And it means it's no longer about me anymore. But again, about me being willing to turn myself over as a tool for a larger thing that needs to happen. Um, and, and there's danger in that thought as well. So we'll come back to that in a minute. But back to what I was saying about it gives. So because I am willing to work with spirit and it, consciously and in a trained way, I can move back and deal with the real root of the problem. And then I can move forward in the future with which then, again, becomes this visioning piece. And how do we work with the dreaming itself to serve it in the manifestation of that dream in the future? And so that you know, that's the other part now. And to do that, I have to be willing to work with other people and helping spirits and their helping spirits to shape some shared sense. It's like a weave of the dreaming. It's as human beings who are decidedly grounded in this moment to imagine a possibility of a different future. And I think, you know, Charles Eisenstein does a great job, especially with the title of his book, you know, the beautiful, the more beautiful world our heart knows is possible. So how do we envision that? And then talk about our current reality to create a tension between what is and what wants to be or what needs to be and hold those two things at the same time because these two things have a dynamic tension between them that then gives birth to the not yet known pieces, the creative pieces, the inspired pieces, the crazy logic pieces, the, the at what at the moment seems insane because it's only in the current moment where we're stuck in this reality that this solution actually seems insane. But once it's done, people will look back at it and see it as the obvious solution. But it's all about – working with spirit to help us to move beyond our limited perspective and trusting that there is this bigger dreaming that supports life and beginning to, you know, push our raft out into that river and not just keep pulling along where we are one hop close to the shore that already exists, but being willing to push out into that current and trust that it is taking me somewhere that is about life. So anyway, I'm, I'm maybe now about to start rambling. So that kind of answered your question, though, didn't it, Langston? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the first part of that question, absolutely. Um, and, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, like, responsibility in, in the, the working to, to manifest a vision a bit. The, like the one I sort of, of deferred? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. So, or, you know, yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. What you're going to say? Oh, I, I was just going to say, like, uh, like I remember we were talking somewhat about how, like, the first question really might ask is, like, what is my responsibility in manifesting this vision? Like, in the context of mm -hmm. all the many people that are right that are affected and involved with this energy. So, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Okay. And so, so here we have the situation, right, where we have a vision and we have a, a, a current reality. We're all, we're all in the current reality. We have a vision. And I think one of the things that is critically important for all of us who are wanting to be involved in creating change is that we actually work together to create a shared vision or a, a, what I weave, where it's really bigger than my perspective. And that the stronger the weave, the more diverse the group of people who come together to express that and to and to weave that dreaming together. And, you know, my perspective of that kind of conversation is that it would be really exciting. But I know for some people that idea sounds really challenging. Um, but I think um, uh, the, the, the more diverse the weave, probably the stronger the vision. But nonetheless, even if you just do this yourself – 
even if you are the only person out in the middle of nowhere doing this yourself and you don't have access to other people, okay, fine, do it yourself. But the point is you have a vision and you have a current reality. And then the next thing you have to say relative to that vision, so if we're talking about racism, right, we're talking about all of America at least, right, but we'll just talk about America. So since there's 319 million people here manifesting this vision, right, that means that I either need to organize millions of human beings to do this with me or I need to lean into spirit because I can't change it for 319 million people. I'm only one 319 millionth of that dreaming. So I either need to mobilize millions of people, which some people that is your calling to do. I get that. And others of us will need to lean into spirit so that I have more than 319 million um, you know, units of support for me in my dreaming. Otherwise, I'm crushed. I will be crushed immediately by the whole prospect of trying to hold this vision and move towards it. Um, so in, in shamanism, the, the, the massive amount of spirit help that I have is my ancestors, right? So then the next thing is we really have to question, is our vision a true vision, or is it just a wish? You know, I wish for a world without racism. You know, like, it, it, a world without racism in and of itself is not a vision. It's just a wish. And so we need to, like I said, we need to work together to craft a bigger vision, a, a fuller vision than just a wish. And then the next thing that I think people really skip over is we assume that we understand the current reality. When in truth, most people are pretty fixated on a very small slice of current reality that is their experience. And so again, in the same way that we brought a diverse group of people together to create a dream weave for the possible future, we need to bring a diverse group of people together to talk about um, reality current reality to really create some kind of shared understanding of all of the dimensions of current reality because fixating only on what is broken so if all current reality is is um the injustice of racism if that's the extent of your current reality you will fail because that scopes down on the one problem without seeing all all the rest of what is present in our current reality, which is there is a lot of humanity and there is a lot of goodness and you're not the only person having these thoughts. And so it's important that our current reality embraces not only the current problem, but the current presentation of possible futures and goodness. I mean, the yeah. current goodness. Well, one thing I might interject there is, yeah, I think that's really important um, point that we need to not just fixate on the problem or fixate on not what's working, but be fixating on, I mean, be opening up and present with the true energies that are all around us, the, of, of everything that is present. And to do that, I think we really need to start with the earlier um, things we shared around cultivating resilience, because if you're just in fear all the time and in denial and and fixated on what's not working, you can't even engage with the good. Like like the ironic thing is in denying the truth of the negative things or, or violent or harmful or scary things happening around you, you also are robbing yourself of your ability to really see the true positive and good things that are actually around you in reality. And I think yeah. that um, there's there's two James Baldwin quotes that I think speak to this that maybe from a slightly different angle, but uh, one of them is that white people are trapped in a history they don't understand. And, and I think this happens frequently because um, white Americans certainly are representing Americans are, are taught a certain history that erases a lot of the, the truth of the current reality of racism in America and the history of it. And then the only people that actually are uncomfortable enough to feel they need to do the work to actually recover and see other versions of that history are people of color uh, often. Um, and they're being taught that version of history when they're much too young to discern differently. You have to exactly, remember, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then another James Baldwin quote is, to accept one's past, one history, is not the same thing as drowning in it. It is learning how to use it. 
An invented past can never be used. It cracks and crumbles under the pressures of life, like clay in a season of drought. Um, and I think what that cracking and crumbling often looks like is the way people collapse uh, often when, um, you know, issues of racism are brought up because it, it cracks open that shame that's underneath the false history in a way. And then it prevents that further visioning process from happening. So I just want to reemphasize in the context of what you're talking about, about visioning, the early work we talked about, about doing the work to cultivate the resilience, to look at your shadows, to deal with ancestral issues, and just in general to, to open up and engage with people who are different than you really is necessary before you can, no, I don't want to say before, because you can be doing these two processes in parallel and one can inform the other. But it's a necessary piece, certainly, of that process of being able to actually accurately perceive a current reality so you can start the process of visioning a new future from that place of, of the current reality. And I think based on what you're saying, Langston, I think we could also say that in, under, in truly understanding current reality, perhaps there is a responsibility to understand true history. So that it doesn't mm -hmm. crumble out from underneath you right in the middle of trying to be useful. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 And I think another thing about what you um, said about the, uh, the diverse or the group, the stronger the weave of the vision, I think that's a very important point as well. And, and um, something that you see echoed in permaculture as well. Like I was just uh, like, you know, just an ordinary reality, physical response to the world to the actions we take. Um, I was reading some interviews with uh, Bill Mollison, one of the founders of uh, Permaculture, who who passed away recently, and he was talking a lot about how where the the highest yield occurs is on the edges, where the most diversity occurs in biospheres, um, and so a lot of the principles of permaculture are about creating those edges and that diversity and these different things coming up against each other, so the yields will be like four times that often of what um, monoculture would create. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a huge, vast potential in these the, the, this visioning process, not just like, yes, I think it's important we're talking about what individuals can do for visioning, but the potential that is in people who are do have different experiences and different backgrounds coming together to vision together to become the people who can do that. There, we have the potential for a much higher yield than what mm -hmm. we're getting currently with our current yeah. reality. And then I think the next thing we also need to be conscious of, and this is back to that recognizing that you are a person of power, no matter what the system says, is, is to really, part of your current reality is understanding what is my sphere of influence. Because everyone has a sphere of influence around them, and this is where we are most immediately and directly effective right now. And um, where does my sphere of influence correspond to the current reality? And, and, and actually to have a sense of knowing yourself then as a person of power and influence in the world. Like where, where is it that I can be most effective and where will my capacity to be effective taper off? And if I can't be effective there, is, a way, is there a way that I can help to empower somebody else who can be? You know, and, and to really understand our relationships with each other in terms of our natural spheres of influence. But, but the important thing is to recognize if your sphere of influence doesn't really include what you truly love and what is truly going to sustain you as you manifest it in the world, then you need to do something to change your sphere of influence. So to put that in, into context – in my, in my young life, the thrust of my education and my visioning was to go into medicine. And that would have put me in a sphere of influence that was very contrary to where my heart really wanted to be and where my, my soul's purpose would align with my sphere of influence. In, in the work that I do now, which I mean, could be argued is still a path of healing. Um, my soul's purpose is, you know, really right in the center of that sphere of influence. And so they they work together to sustain each other. And that's an important thing because often I think what I, I hear in some writings of um, people of color is they feel they have this responsibility because of being an educated person of color or something like that to do this thing that, it, that 
that they are educated to have that sphere of influence, but it doesn't resonate with their heart and soul and what what their real gift to the world is. And that becomes a, a stress, an internal stressor. And so it's important that, you know, along the way of visioning, we sometimes realize we have to reeducate ourselves. We have to realign ourselves because we can't just work where we're effective if our own heart isn't being nurtured by those actions. Um, so I, I think that, that those are some of the main um, elements really in looking at manifesting a vision um, as, as, um, as people wanting to be sort of humane in our experience together. But I think, Within this, you know, we're talking about how do, how do we become the people who can come together and, and do this together? And I think um, within that, we can't lose track of the fact that there is always self-care in that. There is always a necessary piece of self-care that, that part of the, the most fundamental abuse of the visionary, to get direct about this, is inspiring people to, to manifest the vision – in a way that becomes detrimental to their own health and well-being. And, mm. that, and that is really important to remember is that um, if we die halfway to the manifestation, <laughs> we are not really serving the vision, right? That um, it is, it is important and that that is one of the greatest abuses I see constantly by these visionary people that are inspiring us to all go do the work is that in it, there is not um, all of the education around how do I become a person who can um, self-care in the process. I know, Langston, you shared with me some really sort of basic acts of self-care, which a lot of it has to do with not subjecting yourself to certain things on the media. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I remember there was a time – during when the events were at their sort of peak in in Ferguson where I would be in the middle of my work day you know hop on to Facebook for a second I just realized I had to stop doing that because in a few minutes I would just find myself in tears at my desk and having to process and just sort of shove my feeling down to go on with the work day which is not a situation I ever want to be in I want to be able to you know be present with my emotions in the moment but it was just such extreme emotions rising up in these images of um, people of color and violence towards people of color um, that at the time were, you know, since have become very normalized with with new viral videos every day of black people being executed um, by police officers. But in at the time, it was it wasn't that it was new, but there was it, there was sort of a more attention than there had been in the past, I think, to police officers, specifically police officers responding with riot gear that was often military grade um it's just images of like you know tanks rolling into communities of color um and uh so for me that was a basic act of self-care was to realize okay i need to i want to choose how and when i engage with this media and i want to do so in a time and a place that I know I can give myself the self-care I need in that moment. Um, and so I think, so. yeah, that is one thing to really become cognizant of as um, people of color, especially, but also anyone. Um, like, what do you need to continue to stay engaged in this process, to not shut down? What kind of self-care do you need um, that will allow you to do that? And, and what stories on a daily basis are you spending time in are you putting your focus and attention towards are you just as you said before focused on what's wrong and not putting your attention also on what are other people doing to try to create change and help in these circumstances and so i I think that this kind of fits into four categories and and the one you've been talking really well about is this whole be very careful in your consumption of media about getting into agitation without education <laughs> you know, it's just <laughs> and remembering how much of the media is controlled by the very system we're wanting to change and how much of the rest of what we're seeing is simply a reaction to that and and so it's still mm-hmm. the same churning around the same old ideas which takes us out at the knees emotionally and now we're 
become ineffective again at creating change. And so we need to not allow that to happen. And so really be careful about your consumption of the stories that you consume and this sort of agitation without education. The next part of it is, and I think we've talked well about this, is educate yourself. Like engage in some actual education and reading and dialogue and 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 actually educate yourself about now about history about the dynamics that are at play so that you have some real information um and then the next thing i think is is as you said langston being able to you know t- time and place and skills to to engage in the emotions that do arise in a way that helps us come to know ourselves better you know, emotional clearing and to use these um, little small woundings, I will say, as a way to uncover parts of ourselves that are wanting to come home and become whole. Our heart becomes stronger. We become better able to engage. And I would add a fourth thing to that, which is I believe if we are really going to do this personally and collectively, we need to begin together to engage personally and collectively in ritual. And I don't mean religious ritual or culturally bound ritual, but elemental ritual that allow us to, in big ways, move big emotions that start to move through us when we start to open our ourselves to this process. So, for example, um, you know, communities realizing they regularly need regularly need to come together for grief rituals to grieve what is happening. And regularly come together for other rituals to celebrate life, and that and that this this uh, coming together in um, focused rituals around the 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 engagement in this process restores each of us who participate at that level of our heart and soul and reminds us that we are engaged in something larger than us as individuals and that we are not alone in that. We humans are not alone in that. So I think that the, the, those are kind of the four areas that I would think about in terms of your self-care. And for most contemporary people, the place that's utterly missing is the ritual piece. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can't. And it's, you know, it's, it's so hard, I think, to, I, I think many of your listeners would understand, but it's so hard for people who haven't engaged robustly um, with sort of, elemental ritual to understand how powerful it can be um even in people in some occult and spiritual communities i see who've done lots of very complicated like ceremonial ritual in certain traditions or or ways with certain beings or very deity-centric ritual i think there's a different viscerality and shift that occurs in the body um and the heart and the spirit and the mind all simultaneously when you're engaging with those essence energies of the elements in, in a very, um, you know, grounded way. Um, like doing a, a grief ritual or a water ritual for reconciliation, like um, taking the time to do a certain earth embodiment ritual or really taking time to isolate those beliefs that are at the core of some of your fears and then doing a fire ritual to give up those beliefs and, and, and consciously kill them in yourself and in your life so you can give birth to something new in working with fire in that way. I think that, that that's very necessary right now at this time and a huge aspect of self-care that I think a lot of people don't necessarily have the knowledge or the experience um, to do so. Uh, and so I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't know exactly what to, what to recommend necessarily with that except um get the to a person who does who is skilled at engaging in these types of visceral elemental ritual um because there really is no substitute i think for engaging with these practices so i think if i look back on all four shows i think that we've said that we all need to cultivate resilience we need to understand that each people's person's burden relative to that is is different and try to be as empathetic and compassionate as we can in understanding each other. Uh, but we're all going to have to lean in and and develop resiliency, educate ourselves, not make assumptions about each other. And if we're really going to change this vision, it sounds like we all need to learn new things and, and be willing to 
put the time and energy into learning that, whether it's elemental rituals or educating yourself about your real history or whatever it is that when I say, you know, what do we need to do to become the people to do this? I'm, I'm assuming we've all got things to learn. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, it's like there isn't any other way around this, people. We're not the people right now. Yeah. So to, we, we need to become the people. It's one thing I will say with big love in my heart for – those that are in last mass community with me is that we are actually consciously engaged in doing all that we can to become those people. And I, and I applaud all of you for that. And also to say publicly that all are welcome to join us in that community. It's not easy. It's actually really hard work because there are community standards for using skills, learning skills and using them. But at least we're doing it. At least we're trying. And it's one way. Um, it's not everybody's way, but it's one way. And if you want to start now, it's a group of people that are doing it now. I think that's at least fair to say, don't you think, Langston? Mm -hmm. And I think you, you talked about working also with our allies in, you know, our helping spirits and, and the earth. And I think that feels to me also like an integral part of this whole process that I think we forget all of the help that's around us. And that's something that me, per I personally really viscerally learned in the cycle teachings the uh, felt that presence of the help around us and how to engage with them and learn skills for engaging with them but i think even for someone like an assignment that someone might take a, a more advanced practitioner could do this or a person just starting out could do this is to go out somewhere in nature to get off of your computer where you're like constantly in this facebook stream of media or and get out of the out of the you know TV, which I think less people even watch TV anymore. Um, that's not on their computer. But and actually go someplace in nature, whether it be a river or a mountain or or just you know a tree in an urban environment even, and just talk to something in nature, whether it be you're trying to work with the earth itself or an element, um, or whether you're talking to the sun or a breeze, or you're just talking to a tree, like just bring with your prayer with your heart open what are you afraid of right now what are you what are, what terrifies you what are you feeling anxiety about in relationship to either your own life or, or especially um some of these issues of racism and classism and sexism what is really riling you up right now and bring that to nature and then after you bring that also bring what are you grateful for currently and br to bring yourself into that present moment so you're not dwelling on the future or dwelling on the past, or worrying about the future or dwelling on the past. And then out of there, just take a moment to open up, maybe make some offerings of tobacco or something and just listen to what is the response. Just open and, and keep your eyes open. Don't pray with your eyes closed. It's something I learned from Lakota teacher to really witness what's going on in nature around you after you're praying and, and know that that is also part of your answer. Um, I think that just that small action can really make a huge step to open us up to other processes. Thank There's you, the Langston. There and wanting to engage with us, but we're just not always asking. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Langston. That's a great place to leave things. <laughs> <laughs> As we now have gone over our hour here today, and hopefully our, our, our humble offering of these four hours of podcasts can help to begin to stir the pot, um, to move, move us into action um, at this time that we all share, because we are the ancestors' response to this need, and somehow we all together need to become that medicine. So oh, thank you, Langston. Thanks for all the hours that you spent with me, Langston, on these on these four podcasts. I, I deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Christina. So we both give great thanks to our ancestors, those human and non-human ancestors who've gathered around us um, in these in these four weeks. And we give gratitude to the energy of the earth below and the sky above and deep, deep thanks for the human hearts that unite us all. Thank you, everyone. And as Langston said, go out in nature and recognize you are not alone.